She is the most interesting woman in the world. Oh, you might remember the most interesting man in the world. That was a series of commercials for Dos Equis beer. It, it went from like 2006 to 2018. The series of commercials, it was genius, really, really funny. It featured this incredibly suave and urbane older gentleman with a beard who, who, who was perfectly debonair, and he was a man of daring but doing everything with a savoir faire. And you would see exploits in his life. He would be catching a marlin with beautiful women all around him in a Hemingway-like scene, or, or he would be making an incredible pool shot in front of an adoring crowd, or he'd be surfing a killer wave, or he'd be having an arm wrestling contest in South America, these amazing feats. And then you would hear these hilarious voiceovers, absurd and funny. It would say something like, people lean on every word he says, even the prepositions. Or it would say, he once purposely experienced an awkward moment just so he would know what awkward felt like. And, and then the commercial would end back with him in a nightclub surrounded by women, and, and he would look towards the camera and suddenly say, I don't always drink beer, but when I do, I prefer Dos Equis. Stay thirsty, my friends. Well, that went on for years. Do you remember the last one? In that last commercial, they loaded him on a space capsule on a one-way trip to Mars. And as he takes off, the voiceover says, his only regret is he doesn't know what regret feels like. And the commercial's end. That was the most interesting man in the world. Mary Magdalene is the most interesting woman in the world. The early Christians knew this. They saw that she was the first witness to the resurrection. She was the first person to bring the message to the other disciples. So the early church called her the apostle to the apostles. And then when they read the gospel, just like those beer commercials, they imagined her in almost every scene. She's the most interesting woman in the world. So if there was a woman that was unnamed in our gospels, they began to see it must be Mary Magdalene. She's the most interesting woman in the world. And so when they read of the wedding in Cana, the woman's not named there. So the early Christians imagined the woman being married is Mary Magdalene. And of course, Jesus would perform the miracle of turning water into wine for the most interesting woman in the world. And then when they read about a woman that was about to be stoned for adultery, they imagined that somehow she must have fallen into a bad marriage and despair, and, 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 and then she's dragged in front of Jesus. They see that it must be Mary Magdalene, because there is Jesus to save the most interesting woman in the world. They even began to imagine that the beloved disciple mentioned in John was really Mary Magdalene. Somehow it got later changed to be a man, an unnamed man, but they go, it must be Mary Magdalene. And that would put Mary Magdalene at the Last Supper right next to Jesus reclining. The early Christians knew she was the most interesting woman in the world. They began to imagine maybe she was Jesus' romantic partner. And if it sounds scandalous to you, that Jesus would have a romantic partner or a wife, I would only ask, why is it scandalous that he would love someone? Mary Magdalene. So I want to tell you this morning, I want to say it directly. Mary Magdalene is the preeminent disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, I know you think there's, wait, there's 12 dudes, right? I mean, there's, there's 12 guys 
that are the primary disciples. Remember, though, the ancient church knew something different. They said she's the apostle to the apostles. She is the preeminent disciple. Why have you not heard this? Why? Well, because a religion has to take place in a culture, and when Christianity was developing, we're in a culture that is sexist, and it's not a great story to have a woman be the best leading preeminent disciple. It just doesn't really fly. In fact, early on there were critics of Christianity saying that's a silly religion because they saw it. It's a silly religion because a woman is the first resurrection. It, they said she was a hysterical woman. So this is what a sexist society does. It starts to cover up the real story, not a conspiracy. It's just what sexism does. Mary Magdalene is the preeminent disciple. Oh, at our moment right now, forget the ancient church, right now, this gives the lie to any notion that women can't be ministers and priests, can't be ministers and priests. The preeminent disciple of Jesus Christ is a woman. It gives that story the lie. Not only is she the preeminent disciple of Jesus Christ. I will offer you today that she gives each of us a template how to be a true disciple. She is the exemplar. The, the early Christians didn't need to make up all these sort of beer commercials for her because just what's in the gospel alone, it shows she's the mark of a true disciple. Did you notice? These are the steps we have to follow that she first was healed by Jesus, then she responds generously, then she's at the cross, and then she's at the resurrection. In the early church, the main fundament of the faith, the main declaration was Jesus Christ died, was buried, and was raised. It's only Mary Magdalene that is at each one of those, the primary fundament of the faith. So, let's walk through these steps for our own discipleship. First, Mary Magdalene was healed. If you experience being healed by Jesus Christ, that is a primary impulse to be a true disciple. If you feel like you've been changed or made whole by Jesus Christ, you become a disciple. So I want to ask you, have you experienced healing in Jesus Christ? There might be some part of you that you think is unacceptable. Think now, is there some part of yourself you don't fully ex accept? Because then you could know in Jesus Christ that you have been fully accepted. Before you even ask the question, you have been fully embraced by the divine love. If you could experience that, the most primary impulse of discipleship begins. Now, now we've, we've kind of ruined this story. The main way the church has done it is try to indict you of sin, saying you're so wrong, you're so off that you need Jesus Christ to save you. Uh, they're, 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 the church rightly is trying to capitalize on that dynamic. You need to experience healing, but the way the church points the finger, no, it doesn't work. The way it works is if you discover what way you need to be made whole and then see that Jesus Christ offers that healing. And then next, Mary Magdalene responded to what she had received with generosity. When you know how much you have received from God, and then you just orient yourself to the world generously. It said that she was supporting the ministry even financially. Oh, I want to tell you this morning what generous disciples you have been. I, I don't know if you've been tracking this, you have acknowledged the good things God has blessed us with, and you have become generous disciples. Have you been following this? About a year ago, we decided we wanted to do something for medical debt in the central Lincoln neighborhoods. We felt medical debt was an anchor 
around people's a, a millstone around their neck. And we wanted to do something. But then we found out that the debt in Central Lincoln would be very expensive because you have to buy it from a debt collector, and, and these are people that are paying on the debt. And we would have to pay 93 cents on every dollar to buy this debt. And so the trustees began to imagine, can we do this? We wanted to help people. Some people were paying like $50 every month on $4,000. They were never going to get ahead of it. Other people were paying, you know, $25 on $2,000. bucks. would never get ahead of it. We only looked at the debt people were paying on every month, and the trustees decided, we're going to do it. Disciples they were. And then it came to the congregation. They decided for a whole year, the offering plate would go towards forgiving medical debt. Now, the way this works is people have to stay anonymous, right? We don't know who the people were, but we were given anonymized profiles, just saying of not with their address, but they were in central Lincoln. It would just say like a single mother with two kids paying $75 every month or an elderly woman on a fixed income paying $20 a month. We'd just get these anonymous profiles. Then a group of our own disciples would meet every month and pick profiles out of these central neighborhoods that were anonymous and just say, we're buying that one, we're buying that one, we're buying that one, and forgiving it. Throughout the year, we'd gather the money here. The disciples would meet. We're going to buy that one. We're going to buy that one. My generous disciples, I need you to know, as this ends now, this Easter, we have now bought and forgiven the debt of 500 homes in central Lincoln. You generous disciples have given $500,000 this year towards that. That's re yeah, you're clapping for yourself. <laughs> this is knowing that the blessings we have received from God and responding generously. This is following the template of Mary Magdalene. And then, disciples, she went to the cross. If you are going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you have to be willing to face suffering. Life hurts. There will be suffering. Mary Magdalene had the courage, the discipleship, to be alongside you. All the other disciples fled. She was willing to authentically face suffering. The great Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung said the key to mental health is the ability to suffer well. Life is going to hurt. He said that neuroses is the avoidance of legitimate suffering. Well, life is going to hurt, but if you can't face your own suffering, well, then you will fall into neurotic strategies. You'll blame others, or you'll self-medicate, or, or you'll deny it. The key to mental health is learning to suffer well. Life's going to hurt. Can you not run away from it? Can you face it authentically? So often as parents, we try to protect our children, and this is natural. We try to protect our children from all suffering, thinking we're doing them well, and, and we want to. But for a child to grow into fullness, they will have to face some suffering. You can't try to buffer it all away from them. Disciples, can you stand along the suffering of others authentically and with love? Can you be alongside your own suffering? Mary Magdalene, the most interesting woman in the world, when she's standing at the cross, it's also an act of defiance. Did you know that the cross is a Roman form of execution that is designed to terrorize the indigenous population? That's what it is meant for. They crucified thousands upon thousands of young Palestinians trying to terrify the local populace into submission. That's their technique. But Mary Magdalene stands there at the cross. Why did those other guys flee? They're afraid of the empire. 
They're afraid of facing danger. Mary Magdalene stood at the cross. It's an act of open resistance to empire. Just a few decades later, when the Roman general Titus invaded Jerusalem and laid siege. Jerusalem was a walled city, laid siege to the city. When people would try to escape, they would capture them and crucify them along the walls. During that campaign, they were crucifying 500 young Jews a day all along the wall so people had to watch it and see it. They began to run out of wood. They were crucifying so many Jews around those walls. It's an act of state terrorism. But Mary Magdalene went out and stood in the face of it. And then disciples, she she witnessed the resurrection. She was in some way open to miracles. In In your discipleship, you have to be the person that sees new possibilities. You have to be the person in any room or any group that sees the chance for new life or new hope. That is what it is to be a disciple. Do you see the possibility of miracles in any situation, of healing and wholeness and justice and hope? Are you bearing that message? Mary Magdalene, she did. The preeminent disciple of Jesus Christ. She's more interesting than the most interesting man in the world because she's real. And so I say to you, lastly, and based again on a very old commercial, do you remember it? Be like Mike. That's going way back. Be like Mike. Well, I say to you, be like Mary. Be like Mary. Oh, disciples, be like Mary.